Hello guys, we are all welcome to this lecture on bioinformatics resources. And my advice to you all during this current health crisis with uh, the COVID-19 is that all of us should stay safe. So that said, we will proceed. So most of you biological science from the biological science background, you have heard about in vitro studies, you have heard about in silico studies, but very few have heard about, you have heard about in vitro and in vivo studies, but very few have heard about in silico studies. So in silico studies are studies that are done in the computer, in other words, bioinformatics. So what is bioinformatics in its larger sense? It is actually the science that studies the biological systems with the help of a computer. So it is therefore a science made up of two other sciences, that is uh, biological science and computer, biological science and computer science biological science and computer science. And that is what makes bioinformatics a bit complicated because those from the biological science background have very little idea about how computer programming language actually functions. And on the other hand, those on computer science background, they have very little knowledge on how biological systems actually operate. But we'll try to simplify this lecture such that each person can find its own account. So most of the most of the databases that we we'll use here are automated so that those from biological science they will not have to to have an idea or too much idea about computer programming language in order to use these databases. So most of them are automated. So it is the work. So you just have to put in your data and it functions. Why we have tried to simplify it so that those from the computer science background can also know how uh, biological systems operate. Bioinformatics, the whole program of bioinformatics Metrics is central, centered around the central dogma of biology. What is the central dogma of biology? The central dogma says that in the genome, if we get into the genome, we will obtain the DNA. And from the DNA, we can obtain a molecule of RNA or RNAs through the process of transcription. And from the RNA, we obtain proteins through the process of translation. Now, from the RNA, we can also obtain a DNA molecule through the process of reverse transcription in the presence of the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So the forward process is transcription, the backward process is reverse transcription. Also, we can obtain a DNA molecule from a DNA molecule through the process of DNA replication. Now, from the protein, synthesis of DNA and RNA molecules also involve protein molecules in the form of enzymes. Okay, so we can also synthesize DNA and RNA with the help of proteins in the form of enzymes. Now, all of this process takes place inside the cell. So we see this our over structure in white. Is actually the cell to tell us that all these processes, transcription, translation, reverse transcription, replication, and all the others, they are taking place inside the cell. So what happens in bioinformatics is that <clears throat> we try to produce a virtual cell which is similar to our real or natural cell. So this other one below is our virtual cell. Okay, we produce this in the computer and into this virtual cell, we put in data such as the, gen, uh, the genome, DNA sequences, RNA sequences, 
amino acid sequences, protein, protein structures. Okay, so the more we input data into this our virtual cell, to the more likely our virtual cell on the computer will resemble our natural cell. Okay, so that is the basics of or the basic principles of bioinformatics. We create a virtual cell and we try to input data so that it, is, it resembles our natural occurring cell. Okay. Now, there are some issues that are related to bioinformatics and we are going to see some of those issues. The first one we have the proprietary issues. So we we'll notice that most of or some databases are usually or are owned by private institutions and some private companies. And these data are not made available to the public. So it becomes difficult because if you need such a data, you have to take authorization from this institution or companies. Or if they refuse, you won't get access into such databases and so it becomes an issue in bioinformatics we also have the issue of uh, complexity of cellular structures we know that there is the existence of so many species on earth okay and to obtain data from all these species and input it into our virtual cell or our databases is a very tedious and difficult task to accomplish so it is a problem in bioinformatics we also have ethical issues we know there are some databases or some data that is available to the public okay and you don't know who might easily access these databases and take some of this information we have for instance we take terrorism Terrorists might easily assess this information, take it and create a biological weapon, which becomes detrimental to the population. So it is an issue. Another issue is that which is linked to data management. Okay, so as time goes on, many databases are being created, many data is being generated, and all of this data has to be to be served or stored. And so it becomes an issue because we need space in order to store all of this bioinformatic data. Then in order to manage data in bioinformatics, which usually have high volume data, it is usually a difficult or a complicated issue. So there are certain steps which you should culture or follow when managing data in bioinformatics. The first step is that you have to acquire data. Data has to be acquired. And this, in general, comes at the stage of the laboratory. So as you are carrying out different experiments in the laboratory using machines such as sequencers, deep sequencers, quantitative real-time polymerase chain reactions, the polymerase, a simple polymerase chain reaction, these machines develop data. Okay, and when they generate this data, you have to acquire the data from this machine. So that is why we talk about data acquisition. When you have acquired data, you have to develop the data and develop a databases to store this data as well. Because you might generate data, you are not able to use it at the end because you did not develop it. Where you have to acquire it, develop it and store it in a format that you will be able to use depending on what you want to do with the data okay <clears throat> now when you have developed data and databases to store the data you have to analyze the data so when you have developed the data you now analyze the data and now considering that in bioinformatics it will be difficult for you to work with data from a single database you will have to use data from different databases okay and so because you have to use data generated from different databases you have to integrate all of this data from the different 
databases mm, so we have data integration and when you should have integrated the data you have to analyze integrated data again okay so you transform the integrated data into useful information which can easily be interpreted okay so we have been talking about data 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 is data okay so data is any information hmm, which is to be analyzed or stored okay and we have four types of data we have the primary data hmm, which is data that is constituted of primary structure of biomolecules example here we have a nucleic acid and amino acid sequences okay we have secondary data which is data that is constituted of the secondary structure of biomolecules such as protein motifs an example of protein motif we have alpha helix beta sheets and lobes and so on we have the same analogy tertiary data which is data constituted of tertiary structure of biomolecules we have for instance a protein domain that is the way a protein fold itself and then we have quaternary data hmm? we have the case of arrangement of many protein domains okay here we have a single domain folding itself then the quaternary data we have actually different protein domains okay that comes together in the native structure to give the function of the protein now when we have gathered data we have to store it in the computer and the side where data is being stored is known as a database so a data database in a larger sense is the site where data is being analyzed or stored and there are two types we have primary data okay primary data is data that generally comes from experiment okay and has not been modified to some extent and we primary data we have two types we have nucleic acid uh, primary databases we have uh, nucleic acid databases okay these are databases that store nucleic acid sequences and here we have three examples we have the gene bank which is a database that belongs to the united states of america we have the european molecular uh, biology laboratory which is a database belonging to the European Institute of Bioinformatics and we have DNA data base of uh, Japan okay that belongs to Japan and one thing that happens is that all these three databases they exchange data almost on a daily basis so it suffice for you to visit one and you get the information that is linked to the others so you should not be afraid that if you visit one you might be deficit of information because they exchange data on a daily basis a second primary database is protein databases these are databases that store protein molecules okay and we have example here is the swiss prot the swiss prot is uh, a database that belongs to the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics and we have the Uniprot which is a universal protein resource okay and for secondary data databases the secondary database these are databases that contain data that has been obtained from primary databases and has been modified to some extent Okay, so when data is obtained from experiment, it is stored in the primary database. Now, when the data becomes modified, it is stored and stored again, it is stored. That database is called the secondary database. And examples we have molecular structure databases, such as the protein data bank, and we have scope, scope, scope. Okay, we have sequence comparison databases for example the close style w 
these are used generally in multi-sequence alignment comparisons okay we have phylogenetic tree databases example we also have uh, the cluster w there are many other databases okay we have examples a uh, microRNA target gene prediction databases which are used to predict target genes for microRNAs we have pathway predictions okay which are used to predict pathways for genes we have others like proceeds we have pfam we have interpro okay now we move into sequence alignment now generally in the laboratory when you have to do experiments you might happen to discover a certain new nucleic acid sequence or amino acid sequence if you discover something like that initially you don't have any information about what the function of this sequence may be or what this sequence might even help of look like okay you have the sequence but you know nothing about it what is generally done is that this sequence has to be compared to other already existing sequences or in databases okay from other species okay because if you compare them you try to match this your new sequence with other existing sequence coming from databases and you see a great identity or similarity between this your sequence and a sequence from a particular species okay it can give you an information about how this sequence or this the protein from this your sequence might function so it can give you an idea so the act of matching your query sequence that is your new sequence your query sequence into a subject sequence or sequence from a database is actually called sequence alignment okay and there are two types of sequence alignment we have global sequence alignment whereby you compare your whole sequence onto a whole sequence from a database okay and you have local alignment where you have to fragment your sequence into shorter fragments and then compare it onto uh, sequences or other existing sequences from or whole sequences from a database and most modern algorithms work on this local sequence alignment that is we have for example the blast algorithm that uses the local sequence alignment so when you bring your sequence it fragments it into smaller fragments and then compare it into whole sequences from the database okay so I talked about BLAST. So when you are comparing the sequence, that action, or that algorithm is actually called BLASTing. So you are BLASTing your query sequence or your new sequence onto the database okay, to get that sequence alignment. Okay. And when you are doing sequence alignment, there are two parameters that are very important. We have the identity score and we have the E value. The identity score actually tells you how identical your query sequence is to your subject sequence the subject sequence is the sequence coming from your database while the query sequence is the new sequence that you actually want to align so the identity score actually tells you how identical your query sequence is to your subject sequence so the higher the identity score the higher the similarity, the higher the identity between your query sequence and your subject sequence. But on the contrary, we have the E value, which is actually a probability value or some kind of a probability hmm, that tells you whether it is actually significantly different so the e value on the contrary to the identity score the lower the e value the more identical is your query sequence to 
to their subject sequence. So they are actually like opposite. Why identity score the higher? The identity score the higher the identity. The E value, on the other hand, the lower the E value, the higher the identity. Okay, so we have put two words here identity and similarity. What are they? So, identity is actually the norm, the ratio of the number of residues in the query sequence that are identical to residues in the subject sequence to the total residues that are found in the query sequence. Why similarity is the number, is the ratio of the number of residues in the query sequence that are similar to residues in the subject sequence to the total number of residues present in the query sequence. Okay, let's take this example below this example, okay? This example of this alignment. They say we should calculate the identity of the following nucleic acid alignment. So this is a nucleic acid alignment solution. We said identity is the number of residues in the query sequence. This is our query sequence. That is what we want to align to that, to the subject sequence. The subject sequence is that coming from our database. The number of residues that are identical. Okay, so if we look at A is identical to A, C is identical to C, T is identical to T, but G is not identical to C. So what is our identity? Our identity will be the number of residues that are identical in the query sequence to the total number of residues in the query sequence times 100. So that will give us 1, 2, 3 over 1, 2, 3, 4. So it will be 3 over 4 times 100 is equals to 75%. So we see our identity is 75%. Okay. So our query sequence is 75% identical to our subject sequence. Okay, now let's take the second example, this time with amino acid sequences. Okay, so this <clears throat> second example say calculate the identity and the similarity of the following amino acid sequences. For one, one is this case one. Okay, this is case one, this amino acid sequence. <clears throat> Identity is A is identical to this, so we have one, two, three, four, four identical amino acid sequences, all over four. The total number of residues in the query sequence, so it's four over four times 100, which is 100%. It is 100% you can actually see from here because our query sequence is directly identical to our subject sequence. So its identity is 100%. For similarity, A is identical to A and is also similar to A. M is identical to M and is also similar to M. T the same and L the same. So ident similarity is number of residues similar in the query sequence. Okay, all over the total number of residues in the query sequence. So it's also 4 over 4 times 100 which gives us a hundred percent. Now for case two, this is our case two, this is our case two here, okay? This is our case two. Identity is A is identical to A and M is identical to M, but E is not identical to D. We should note that this is methionine, this is alanine, E is glutamic acid and D is aspartic acid okay so a is identical to this m is identical to this so what will be our identity will be two all over four okay so it's two over four times 100 which is 50 percent telling us that just two of them 
of our amino acids in the query sequence are actually identical to the to the residues in the subject sequence. Now, for similarity, okay, A is similar to A, M is similar to M, E is not identical to D, but E is similar to D, okay? Glutamic acid is similar to aspartic acid because if you replace glutamic acid with aspartic acid in a chain, okay, you see that the function would, of that protein will not change that much. The reason is that glutamic acid and aspartic acid have polar side chains. And they do not just have polar side chains, but also they have, uh, they have carboxyl. They have carboxyl side chains, okay? So E is similar to D. The E is not similar to A because this is has a polar side chain, while this alanine has a non-polar side chain. So for similarity for this is A, M, E, okay, which is one, two, three over four. So it's three over four times a hundred, which gives us 75%. So we see that the difference so we see that here similarity is greater than similarity is greater than identity okay similarity is greater than identity now with amino acid we see some there is a complication that comes in okay now how do we know how similar an amino acid residue is to the other or what degree of similarity can be compared between an amino acid residue and the other. If we take, for instance, glutamic acid, which we had here, aspartic acid, and alanine, glutamic acid and aspartic acid are similar because they are polar. But alanine is not similar to these two because alanine has a non-polar side chain. Okay? But now if we take glutamic acid, aspartic acid, and another polar amino acid residue like uh, tyroxine okay the three of them are similar in the sense that the three of them have a polar side chain but when you look at glutam gluta glutamic acid and aspartic acid they are more similar again as compared to tyroxine although the three of them have a polar side chain but glutamic acid and and aspartic acid are more similar because they are not just both polar, but they have a similar uh, uh, amino acid side chain that is a polar group, that is the carboxyl group, okay? Why tyroxine has but the hydroxyl group, although the three of them are polar, but glutamic acid and aspartic acid are more again similar as compared to tyroxine. So how do we how do we solve this problem of the similarity and the degree of similarity? That is where we need a score matrix in order to handle such a Okay. So an example of a score matrix is the Blossom 62 square matrix. If we look at this first row, we have all the 20 amino acids that have been Align. I will look at this first column. We see all the 20 amino acids that have been put together. So the Blossom 62 matrix have actually calculated the score for each amino acid pairing. Okay. If we take for this our example below, they have asked us using the Blossom 62 square matrix determine the similarity score for the amino acid sequence alignment two. So this is amino acid sequence alignment two. It is actually the amino acid alignment that we saw in the previous slide okay so if we take a matching to a if we come to our table when a is matching to a what is the score the score is four okay it's plus four so we come and put our plus four here when m is matching to m what is the score m matching to m the score is plus 5 okay so we put our plus 5 
When E is matching to D, because E is similar to D, what is the score? When D is matched with E, okay, so the score is plus 2. So we put our plus 2. When E is aligned with A, okay, they are not similar, okay? When E is aligned with A, what is our score? Okay, our score is minus 1. So we put our minus 1. So when we sum all of it, this gives us a total similarity score of 10. So this is actually the real score of, of uh, this alignment, okay, using the Blossom 62 matrix. The other one we did was an approximation, okay. So this is actually the real score. So for amino acids, we can determine the similarity using the score matrix, okay. So the main question now will be how does the computer do this thing? What is the principle that underlines or that underlies this principle of sequence alignment? Okay, what is principle? So when you give your sequence into the computer, how does the computer manage to know that this is the best alignment that will give you the best score and align it to have the most minimum E value or the most maximum identity score so how what is the principle how does the computer do this so we'll do this by taking this example align the query sequence this which is our new sequence that we want to align to other sequences in the database align the query sequence a g c t to the subject sequence g c t okay so <clears throat> When you submit a sequence like this one, that the computer should align with the database sequence or the subject sequence this, what the computer does is that it can align this in many different ways, okay? I will do all of those combinations and then attribute a given score to each of the combination and then take the one with the highest score. For the purpose of our presentation we are going to take just these three alignments mm? but we should know that there are many alignments that the computer will produce so if we take case one mm? this is case one we take case one okay what the computer can align this by first putting a gap mm? putting a gap then putting our g c t Okay, now in a second case, the computer can start with a G, then put a gap in the middle, and then put C, T. Okay, and then in a third case, the computer can start with G, C, put a gap, and then put T, as well as many other combinations. But we'll concentrate on this theory. What happens is that in the computer, when there is a perfect match, it gives some arbitrary values, okay? Let's take, for instance, a match. The computer might decide to give it a plus one, okay? When there is a mismatch, it gives it minus one, okay? What we should note here is that when there is a mismatch, the value should be lesser than that of the match. You can take still plus two for the match. You should also vary the value of the mismatch. It should be lesser. Than that of the match okay now when there is a gap a gap is the worst because it means that any nucleotide can come in here so its own score or value it should be lesser than that of the mismatch so we give it the computer gives it an arbitrary value minus two okay now if we take case one okay case one let's calculate the final score when a is aligned with the gap okay the value is minus two so we put our minus two when g has a perfect match with g 
we put our what is the value for perfect matches plus one we put our plus one c perfectly matches with c so we put plus one c matches with c so we put plus one so when you sum all of this it gives you plus one okay now we take case two a and g is a mismatch so we put our minus one g matches with a gap is minus two so we put our minus two C perfectly matches with C, so we put our plus one, and C matches with T, so we put another plus one. So when you sum all of that, it gives you minus one. We come to the third case. A has a mismatch with G, so the value is minus one. G has a mismatch with C, so the value is minus one. C matches us with a gap, so if the value is minus two, so we put our minus two. C perfectly matches with C, so we put our plus 1. When you sum all of that, it gives you minus 3. When you look at all these three cases, you see that the one with the highest score is case 1. That is this one. So the most correct alignment is case 1 with the highest score. Okay? So our the, the alignment that the computer will give you will be this one, the one with the highest score. If you look at it, you will agree also with the computer that the computer is right because here it actually has three matches. Okay, so this one is more likely than this one that has just two matches and then this one that has just a single match. Okay, so we now move into um, we now move into data format. Okay, so this is also an important, very important part of bioinformatics. You might have data and you are not able to analyze it because you don't know the right format to submit the data. Or in another scenario, you might not be able to get the required data that you need from a database because you don't actually understand the format of which data is being presented in the database okay so we take the example of uh, we take the example of we take the first that data format that is the gene bank format it is divided into three parts we have the header section the future table and the sequence section now when you get into the header section is actually trying to describe the the, the sequence that you would get so it gives you some basic information about the sequence. You see, they give you the definition, okay? They tell you the human prion protein, okay? The human prion protein. So here you have the accession. The accession or the accession number is actually the unique ID of the sequence of this sequence. So if you copy this ID here, okay, you copy this ID. And you put it into the gene bank it will give you this exact sequence okay so it is the unique id of your sequence then this is the version okay because you might have different people that might have submitted it so that you have different versions okay so you have keywords hmm? they tell you it is the human it is the prion protein so you have the source the source is the organism from where this protein has been isolated. They tell you it is Homo sapiens, so it's coming from humans. Then the organism, okay, is Homo sapiens. And under the organism, they give you the organism classification. It comes right down here, okay? So you have the reference. This is the reference of uh, the authors, okay? You have the authors. These are the people who submitted this sequence, the people who gave this sequence this is the title this title should be the title of the article that has been published mm, with this sequence so if you go online you will see with this uh, title you can also get the article to read from which this sequence was uh, or has been published you have the journal in which the sequence was published and you have the PubMed. Okay, reference. I have other comments below. 
Now, when you go to the future table, it tries to give you the number of residues. So here they have given you the gene, okay? And they tell you this gene is from re residue 1 to 2420, okay? So it has this number of residues. The genes have this number of residues. You have the messenger RNA tells you it start also starts from 1, okay? The number of residues from 1 to 2420 residues. You also have the coding sequence. The coding sequence does not start from 1 to 2420. It starts from 77, okay? From residue 77 to residue 814. They have some few uh, details there. And then below, they have given you the amino acid sequence of that you are putting, the human prion protein. That starts from here, okay? From M, from methionine, okay? right up to here okay that is guanine okay so this is the amino acid sequence of that human prion protein then in the sequence section they give you the nucleotide sequence of your protein you see it starts this origin shows that it starts from here okay it starts from here and they tell you it is 171 base pair upstream from smai site okay moving upward from chromosome and that is from chromosome 20 okay so you start here you have this one this one is to tell you that this is where the sequence begins it begins with c cytosine okay and it moves right up to 60 and then it comes back and start at 61 how do I know that it ends here at 60? It's because this sequence continues, okay? It continues right up to the end. So if here is 1 and then here is 61, it means that it starts from 1, goes up to number 60, and then comes back and starts here at 61, 62, 63, okay? And goes right up to 120 and so on, comes and starts back at 121. So when you see these double lines down here, it is to tell you that this is the end of the sequence. Okay, that is the end of that amino, uh, I mean the nucleic acid sequence or the nucleotide sequence. Okay, so the format is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory format. It is similar to the gene bank, okay in the sense that it has three sections to the header, the future table, and the sequence. But the difference here is that most of the entries have been abbreviated, okay? So here we have like the accession, is the accession number that has been abbreviated. We have the version, okay? We have the version, we have like the description of the protein, okay? We have... Uh, we have those keywords there. We have the organism source, okay? This is the organism source that has been abbreviated as OS, Homo sapiens. We have the organism classification that continues on these two lines, okay? The organism classification that has been abbreviated as OC. So we see the organism of origin, the classification. And they have all of those other information, the the, the the reference, okay, the reference, we have uh, the research authors, we have the research title, we have the journal, and so on, just the same like in GeneBank, but the format is that it has been abbreviated. Then here also we have the messenger RNA, the number of residues, tells us that it's from 1 to 2420. The coding sequence is from 77 to 814. You have some computer jargons there mm -hmm. and then you come you also see the amino acid sequence that starts from m from here mm -hmm. from m right up to g okay right up to g that is in the future table and then we have now in the sequence they have also given us the nucleic acid sequence it also starts from c so it's the same thing like the one in gene bank because it is the same human prion protein so it starts from nucleotide 1, which is C, and ends at G. So you see those double lines here again, okay, to tell you that that is where the sequence 
ends. Now, you see that this one is different from the, this format is different from the gene bank in the sense that you have the number of residues per roll is instead on your right, but that on gene bank was this way on the left. Okay, so you start from here, you move right up to 60. So this is the 60 to tell you that there are 60 nucleotides on the first row. Okay, it comes and so it starts from 1 to 60, comes back and starts from 61 to 120 residues, comes and continues from 121 and so on. Okay, now with uh, this, <clears throat> we might also have another case where this nucleotide sequence might be too long, so they will not give you all the sequence. Okay, let's take this example. Voila. So you see that here it ends at 600, then it continues at 140,640. You will bear with me that this number of residues cannot take you from residue 600 to residue 140,640. Okay, if you look at these double strokes, those are the double strokes to tell you that this sequence ends here. Okay, and then for the for the for the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, you see it starts with SQ. That is the sequence. It starts with SQ here. Okay. It does not start with origin like in gene bank. It starts with SQ. So you see this SQ at the beginning of the nucleotide sequence. You know that is from EMBL. Okay. Voila. So when you look at this difference, you see that there are so many nucleotides that have been omitted and then you see these three dots these three dots are to tell you that it's like that there are many nucleotides that have been contracted here they have been contracted and they have not been shown okay so if you want that all the nucleotides that are here mm, that live from 600 to this to 140,640 you want all those nucleotides you click or you double click on those three dots and they will give you all of the nucleotide okay now we have the faster format this faster format is very very important because most databases ask you to submit your data in the faster format what is actually the faster format the faster format is this greater than sign here this greater than sign so the faster format should be this greater than sign so if you have any sequence, okay, the greater than sign. If you have any sequence, for example, this is our example below here. The sequence this in the faster format will be this. So you just add the greater than sign in front of the sequence and then you submit. So this has been downloaded in the faster format. You submit this like this to a database and it will read if they say submit in the faster format and you do not put this greater than sign it will show you the database will show you error it cannot read it okay so you have to put that greater than sign now when you look at this sequence you see that there are some additional information here because the sequence actually starts from here okay starts from there and ends here okay but now you have some other information. You have this number, you have a GB. This GB is to tell you that this sequence was downloaded from Gene Bank, okay? And then they give you the accession number. You have the organism or the origin of this sequence. It's coming from Oriza Sadiva. Mm -hmm. And this is the group of the group that worked on, or the research group that worked on and came out with this sequence. That sequence is found on chromosome 11, okay, that has been cloned onto that vector. And that is, they tell you, is the complete sequence. So this is the complete sequence of Oriza sativa, okay? Voilà. So that is it about the faster format. So we also have uh, the multi-sequence alignment format. And an example of the multi-sequence alignment format is the align faster format. You see faster coming in again. And we say when we say faster is 
you add the greater than sign. If you look at this, we will know from here that we have actually three sequences, okay? Three sequences that have been aligned. The reason being that we know that since it's a faster format, it must start with this. So it starts from here and ends here, okay? The next sequence starts from here and ends here, okay? The next sequence is this, and then we have the third sequence that starts from here, okay, and ends here. When you see those uh, dash, 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 you know that it is, and is that is a gap, okay? That means that the, the nucleotide there or the amino acid there is missing. It might be a deletion, it might be whatever, okay? So it means that the amino acid in that sequence is actually missing. And we should note the difference because we also see the cluster W format, which is also a form of a multi-sequence alignment format. It is a bit different from uh, the align faster format. The difference is that first, the align faster format starts with the faster format that is the greater than sign it aligns the amino acid for one sequence complete it then it takes that of the second one goes right up to the end then it takes that of the third one but this is not the case with the cluster w format okay the cluster w format which is also a form of multi-sequence alignment okay you see that here this does not have the faster sign, okay? It does not have the faster sign. And secondly, it takes a certain number of residues from each species of organism, aligns it with that of the others. When it should have finished aligning from all of the organisms, then it takes again the second uh, line of residues mm, from that same organism, unlike with they align faster format where it takes from one organism right up to the end. It takes from the other right up to the end. With the cluster W, it starts, if we look at this, they are comparing ATP7B from different organisms, that is from mouse, from rat, from human, from ovis, arrays. Okay? So it takes 59 residues, amino acid residues from the ATP 7B of mouse, align it, take the next, okay, from rat, align it, takes the next from humans, align it, takes the rest from ovis, aries, and aligns it. Then it comes back and takes the next line, okay, from each of those organisms. So you see that here, hmm, this is residue 59 for ATP 7B coming from the mouse. So this should be number 60, okay? This should be residue number 60 from the mouse, okay? This is residue 70 or 47. This should be uh, 48, okay? Coming from the mouse, okay? So that is how it aligns it, and that is the difference between the cluster W format and the align faster format which are both forms of multi-sequence alignment. Then with this cluster W, you see these stars. This stars is to tell you that all the residues hmm, in all the species across this line is the same or is identical, okay? Now, when you see a single dot, is to tell you that few, like here, is to tell you that few of few of these residues are different, okay? And when you see two dots, it should tell you that many of the residues are different, okay? Voila. So that is that for sequence alignment and data format. So from there, we move now into the applications of bioinformatics. The first one, we take computer-aided computer -aided sequence or computer-aided drug design. Hmm? So this is actually the act of designing drugs with the help of 
the computer. Hmm? Now, this process takes a number of steps and we have to go through those number of steps. Now, in the lab, you might have a target protein, okay? You have discovered a target protein in one microorganism or one pathogenic uh, organism, microorganism, and you want to design a drug or an inhibitory ligand against that target enzyme or receptor molecule in that organism. Okay, now you know the ligand and you know the target enzyme or the ligand or the inhibitory ligand per se, the inhibitory li ligand. So what you can do, you can use computer-aided drug design to design the actual inhibitory ligand or drug which you can now go ahead to test on a weight lab. Because if you want to test different molecules, it will take you so much time. You have so much molecules to screen, screen in order to get a particular inhibitory uh, ligand, okay, or drug. So you have to pass through bioinformatics to limit your search so that when you are going to the lab, you are actually going to test something that is precise. So in order to go on with the computer-aided drug design, the first thing you have to do is you look for the most suitable and similar template, hmm? most suitable and similar template of your enzyme or, or the receptor molecule. Okay, and you can do this using the Swiss model database. Okay, or other databases, but I prefer this because it is automated and it will be good for, for beginners like you who are from the biological science background. With this, you don't need to a lot of uh, biology, uh, computer programming knowledge in order to use this. You just go there and input your data and it does the modeling for you. So here, when you submit your, your target enzyme or receptor, the Swiss model will look for the most similar template of this enzyme, okay? And now when it has looked for the most similar template, you now build a homology model. The same, you now build a homology model with the template, okay? And you can still do that using the Swiss model database, okay? So when you have looked for the most similar template, because it will give you different templates, but you take the one, the first that is most similar to your enzyme or receptor molecule. Now, you do your homology model, okay? of the template and not of the enzyme of the template hmm? homology model is actually building a, a 3d structure of your protein such that it will it models it such that you will when you bring in your ligand you will see where to fit into the active site and that you can do it using the swiss model database okay so when you should have modeled your, the, your template okay into the 3d you cannot download the homology model okay download the homology model into the appropriate format i would recommend you to download it in the p or the protein data bank format because most dogging uh, databases use this format mm -hmm. so it will be easy for you to use later in the dogging database now when you should have downloaded it you store it in your computer then you go ahead and you search for the most suitable similar homolog of your inhibitory ligand or drug okay your inhibitory ligand or drug that you want to design mm -hmm. and this can be done on the zinc database okay you can do this on the zinc database or other data basis and when you should have looked for the most suitable and similar homolog what do you do you now download this homolog of the ligand in the appropriate format hmm? so some common formats we have the sdf and we have the mol2 format so my advice is that if you will have to use the swiss doc database for for uh, your dogging process, you can 
download in the mo2 format but if you have to use autodoc okay you download in the sdf format but i will advise you to download this for beginners okay and use the swiss doc database my reason you you look at most of these databases i use the swiss model the swiss doc and swiss 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 my reason for using this is because most of these Swiss databases are, I'm not doing any advertisement for them anyway, is that they are available online on the web, okay? You might not need to download them in order to use them. So you use them on the web directly. They are automated. So you don't need computer programming uh, knowledge in order to use this databases and also they are free okay voila so now when you should have downloaded i said if you have to use autodoc you can download in the sdf format but if you have to use the swiss doc for your dogging you use you download in the mo2 format okay now after you now at this level you have your model for your your 3d model for your enzyme or receptor and then you also have the you also have your the model for your inhibitory ligand or drug okay now you can carry out the dogging process the dogging process is actually trying to fit your inhibitory ligand into the 3d structure of your enzyme or receptor molecule okay such that it fits in the analogy of a key feeding into the lock okay yes that is how enzyme usually bind to their substrate or receptor to the ligand so here you are actually producing an inhibitory ligand that will fit into the molecule and then inhibit the molecule from carrying out its activity then when you should have done this dogging process which i also recommend you can use the swiss dog database that is also available online then you not also want that your inhibitory ligand should go into the host. Let me say that your pathogen was is a bacteria or a fungi that is found that infects the human system. You will not want that your inhibitory ligand should go and then start binding to other proteins in the human system or into the host or binding host proteins so what you do after doing this is that you test for toxicity by dogging your ligand or drug against host proteins so you try dogging it against the human host proteins okay or the human proteins since the human is the host of the pathogen so you dog it against different proteins in the human system mm -hmm. and make sure that this protein does not also inhibit other proteins or normal proteins in your host because if this should happen they will cause many adverse effects so the second application is for microRNA target gene prediction what are microRNAs so microRNAs are short non-coding RNAs of about 18 to 22 nucleotides which usually regulate gene expression by binding mm, to messenger RNAs, either causing their temporal silencing or their degradation. Okay, <clears throat> so we see this diagram here. Mm. Now, micro, this is our micro RNA up here, and this is our messenger RNA. Micro RNA generally bind to messenger RNA regulating expression by binding to messenger RNAs okay <clears throat> and they do so by using their seed sequence there's the seed region or the seed sequence is nucleotide 2 to 8 of the micro RNA okay that binds to the messenger RNA <clears throat> excuse <clears throat> so considering that micro RNAs binds to messenger RNA to regulate gene expression most Target gene prediction tools make use exploit this principle. Okay, they exploit this principle of this binding 
mm. to predict the target gene. You know, when we talk of messenger RNA, we are actually talking of genes, okay? That is the gene that is being transcribed in order to be translated into a proton. <coughs> okay? <coughs> Sorry. So, microRNAs, they bind to messenger RNA and... <coughs> And target gene prediction tools, they exploit that binding to predict the target gene of every microRNA, okay? And one thing we should also note is that microRNA, a single microRNA might have many target messenger RNAs that it can bind to. There are many common features of microRNA target gene prediction tools, okay? Some make use of the seed match, okay? The seed match, like we said, this is the seed region. Mm? So, when this seed region binds to a microRNA, what condition should be taken or what condition should be fulfilled such that this messenger RNA is taken as the target gene for this microRNA? <clears throat> Some prediction tools will say that if because the seed region has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven nucleotides, okay? Some prediction tools will say that if there is a perfect match between the seven nucleotides of this seed region and that of the messenger RNA, then this messenger RNA should be considered as a target for the micro RNA. Okay, some will say that if only six of the nucleotides of the seed region matches that of the messenger RNA, then that messenger RNA is a target gene for that microRNA. We also have conservation. It is actually the conserved sequences that sequences that are conserved from one species to the other, so over several species. Okay, some prediction tools will say that if this sequence, this sequence that the microRNA binds to is a conserved sequence in different species, then this my messenger RNA is a target for the microRNA. We have the free energy, okay? So the free energy determines how stable this binding is, okay? The, the lower or the more the negative the free energy, the more stable is this, uh, this binding between the microRNA and the messenger RNA. And the more likely that this messenger RNA will be a target for the microRNA, okay? <laughs> then we have site accessibility. This is how easy the microRNA assess its binding site in the messenger RNA. The more easier it can assess this its binding site on the messenger RNA. On the messenger RNA, the more easy that messenger RNA is a target for that micro RNA. Okay. <laughs> now one thing we should note is that uh, no single tool is difficult to find a tool, a target gene prediction tool in <clears throat> bioinformatics that use just one of these features or parameters okay so most of the tools that you will see will either combine two or more of these <clears throat> of these features okay two or more of these features and there are many other features that they can also use in combination such as the percentage of guanine to cytosine bonds present within this bond region okay so the higher the 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 percentage of guanine to cytosine bonds the higher also this messenger rna might likely be a target of the micro rna so you those are some of the features that you have some tools might use in association to other but most of the tools use these four that we have made mention of, okay? And what you will notice, when the microRNA is binding to the messenger RNA, it usually binds to the 3' 
untranslated region of the messenger RNA, okay? Although you might have some bindings that take place in the coding sequence, some binding that takes place in the 5' prime untranslated region, but mostly this binding takes place at the 3' prime untranslated region of the messenger RNAs, <clears throat> okay? Voilà. So this table tries to show us examples of uh, some microRNA target gene prediction tools. We have the Miranda, we have the Miranda, Mi SVR, the target scan, and so on. Okay, so we see like the Miranda, it makes use of the seed match conservation free energy. Okay. The Miranda Mi SVR makes use of the seed region, the conservation, the energy, the free energy, the site accessibility, and it also provides machine learning. So you can do some tutorials on that. You have the target scan that makes use of seed match conservation. Okay, so it makes use only of those two. Then you have the Dynamicro TCDs. Makes use of the seed match, the conservation, the free energy, the accessibility, the target site abundance, and we also we also provide machine learning. <clears throat> now below here we still have uh, some websites where you can see you can find these uh, target gene prediction tools. Okay, now you see online use like this Miranda. It is you will not find it online, okay? And they tell you that it needs a source code. So when you download it, you will need a source code from the provider in order to access it. Mm? User adjustability. So it needs some programming in it, okay? <clears throat> and then you look at the user level, it's advanced. So for beginners, I will not advise you to use uh, the Miranda because it will be complicated for you mm. it's only for advanced users then you see something like a target scan dynamicro t they are and also miranda me svr they are online tools okay they do not need a source code okay you don't need to adjust it it's for is you look at the user level so it's for everybody so this can be recommended okay for learners or for beginners, the target stand, the Dynamicro T, the Miranda, okay? Also coupled with the fact that they are free and are freely available online. Another limitation might be that, okay, you want to use Dynamicro T because it's available online and the user level is for everybody and does not need a source code, okay? But now, <clears throat> when you go into the Dynamicro T, for instance, you have... An organism like cow, you want to do the microRNA target gene prediction in cows. Then you go into the Dynamicro TCDs and you don't find <clears throat> a microRNA expression in cows. So it will become due to the lack of the species or the expression in the species, it will become difficult for you to look for this so you have to look another alternative might be target scan where you have micro rna expression in cows so we see that <clears throat> limitation of the data might cause you to to change a good data and use to change from a one nice tool that you might want to use and use another the one thing with micro rna target gene prediction is that uh, the ideal is usually to use uh, uh, three target prediction prediction of microRNAs by three, two or more target prediction tools, and then you look at where the genes overlap, the genes that have been predicted by these three tools, and then you copy hmm, so that you avoid false positive result. Okay, and at times I always like to use the Dynamicro T because it also has data that has been predicted by target scan and it gives you genes and then it tells you whether these genes have been predicted also by target scan and by tar tar is uh, it usually gives uh, tar is also a target gene prediction tool that gives uh, data which has been experimentally proven okay <laughs> so the third uh, application of bioinformatics is uh, pathway prediction 
Now, after predicting your genes, okay, you might want to go into the lab and then test hmm, these genes and test it on the bench. Or you might also want to go ahead to use the computer to predict which pathway is highly enriched by these genes or the genes from your prediction. Hmm? So knowing the pathway that has been highly enriched by genes that are targeted by a microRNA might easily tell you which pathway this microRNA by mainly be influencing okay voila so here we have example of pathways such as the kyoto encyclopedia of gene and genomes which the pathway focus is it focuses on metabolic pathways signaling pathways and uh, it also gives diagrams. We have another one, the gene ontology, okay, that focuses on proton proton interactions, focusing on metabolic pathways and signaling pathways. We have reactome, okay, that focuses on metabolic pathways, signaling, and also gives a diagram. Okay, there are many of such uh, pathway prediction tools. So, those are the applications of BioInfo. Metis. If you want to learn more about um, microRNA target gene prediction and uh, pathway prediction, I would like to read to download and read uh, these two papers. Okay, these two papers are some of our recent papers that we published on microRNA prediction and uh, pathway prediction. So if you read those two articles, you get more insight on how to use bioinformatics mm, to predict genes, targets for microRNAs and pathways, okay, and get more detailed information. Okay, on this, I also put some practical questions, okay. I know we are going to see it during our practical sessions, but you can pause and then copy this and maybe try to do it on yourself because the more frequently you use bioinformatic databases, the easier it is for you to get acquainted with. Okay, and mind you, most of this data has been made using, has been developed, <clears throat> has been designed, or this practical question has been designed such that you will mostly use automated databases, hmm? databases that you will not have to do computer programming hmm? you might not have to know much about pro computer programming language in order to use it most of them or oh, they are free hmm? they are free and they are available online on the web so you can post this and copy the practical questions you have section a section b and section c is on the next slide hmm? you can also post and copy section C. Okay, so that is it. That is the introduction to bioinformatics and summary mm -hmm. for beginners, such as those of biological science. Mm -hmm. So these are the methods that you can use, and then <clears throat> it easily gets you to. We talked about uh, computer edit uh, drug uh, design. So I forgot to make mention of the fact that at times, like for those biological science students that will have to screen plants for antimicrobial substances. At times, you might do that and then you isolate a compound. Mm -hmm. That is a new compound that you have isolated. Now, you will not follow the normal procedure that we mentioned under CAT. Okay? You will have to develop, you will have to, you can use something like the Swiss target prediction tool, which is also available online. Okay, to look for the target because that is a new substance, and so you don't know the target enzyme. Okay, so you can use that your target, you can use that your ligand, submit it to the Swiss target prediction tool. I said this is a database that is also available online. The Swiss target prediction tool. Okay. So when you submit your ligand to it, it will also look for uh, homologous uh, uh, 
target enzymes or receptors that that your ligand can bind to okay so when it look now for it you can now imagine the type of target that uh, that your ligand can bind to okay and then now you follow the normal uh, cut process that we have described before okay so in that case you now have your ligand and then you have your enzyme which you can match on to to it okay so that said i think we will end here and i wish you the best and we'll meet again during our practical session so have